Holy crap, it's the last day for what turned out to be the biggest sale Mind Pump has done in our entire history. Literally, the biggest sale. So here's what we did. Oh, by the way, I know that's why you're here. One of these bundles I'm about to talk about, we're going to give away for free to one of you lucky viewers, all right? So let me go into detail about what these are all about. So here's what we did, right? For January, for this month, we put together three workout bundles. One is for beginners, one is for people who are intermediate, and one is for people who are advanced. And here's what we did. In each bundle, we took multiple MAPS programs that worked together, put them together for each of those categories, beginner, intermediate, advanced. Nine months of exercise programming is each bundle, right? So if you got one of the bundles, let's say you did the beginner one, from now, from when you start till the end, you have nine months planned out for you. So that's, you know what your exercises are, you know sets and reps, you have video demos showing you how to do the exercises right, tempo, everything planned out for you, okay? So it's all set up. Again, beginner, intermediate, and advanced. They're 70% off on sale right now. One of you lucky viewers will get them for, one of them for free, your choice. Here's how you can enter to win. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. Do all those things. Then we'll notify you. You let us know which bundle you want, beginner, intermediate, advanced, uh, and we'll give it to you for free. Everybody else, each of those bundles is on sale tremendously. It's 70% off. We actually debated whether or not we should do this. We did, and it was a hit. Lots of people getting started, lots of rave reviews. Huge sale, but it is the final day. So if you want to take advantage of this, as of the dropping of this podcast, that's the last day, okay? So if you're interested, go to mapsjanuary.com, click on the bundle for you, or do all three, sign up, and you're all set. By the way, if you just want to try one MAPS program, right? If you've heard about MAPS, you've watched our videos, you've listened to the podcast, you're not sure if you want to commit to nine months of our exercise programming, just do one MAPS program just to try it out. Do MAPS Anabolic. It's the flagship program. We put that one on 50% off to help people like you out who maybe are unsure, right? So that program alone is also 50% off. That is also ending today. If you just want to do that, go to mapsred.com um, and then use the code January50 for that 50% off discount. Now, this particular show is awesome. It's all about your favorite exercises. If you can't do them, what do you do instead? Enjoy the show. All right, so I think we've established uh, through our thousands of podcasts that there's some exercises that are just extremely valuable and other exercises, well, I'd say this, all exercises are valuable when applied appropriately, but generally speaking, they're not all equal, right? Some exercises just, they just give you a huge bang for your buck and others maybe not so much in terms of muscle building and fat loss and metabolism boosting and functional applications, all that stuff. Someday we'll come out with a rating system. I was just going to say, we're you gonna should put have Justin, there. since he's not really doing anything, go through and like list. <laughs> I don't really do <laughs> anything, you guys. I mean, I just sit here, twiddle my thumbs. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? Let's, let's have Justin make a, a running list of every exercise ever, Justin, ever done. Justin, you color code all the exercises yes, that exist? Sure. Yeah, the, yeah, I love, doing that. I I love, love the, doing that stuff. I love when the audience that like suggests things like that. You know, yeah. there's like absurdly fucking like, take months to do yeah. for like, no Can return. you put them in alphabetical Could order? You just do this for us, yeah. please? and color code them all. Yeah. <laughs> no, so okay, so and we know, like, like the, for example, the squat, right? It's like such a valuable exercise, and what you know, as a trainer, I saw so much from the squat. One exercise for so many clients, and I, I could literally say that it's as good as the next five exercises combined, type of deal, right? So very valuable. But here's the challenge: people hear us talk about some of these exercises, they know that they're valuable. They go and try them, or maybe they've done them before and they just can't do them anymore because of pain. Mm. They hurt, and that's a that's a, a viable, I guess, for lack of a better term, excuse, right? I don't yeah. squat, I don't deadlift, I don't whatever because it hurts my body. So, you know, what should I do? What do I do instead? Well, I think this is a good opportunity to address um, this idea too. Like when we talk about like deep squatting, squatting, deadlifting movements that we think everybody should include or work towards in their routine the important part of that statement is the the work towards yeah yeah um because the reality is when i go back and i think of all the people that i've trained over the years um there's many clients that couldn't do deadlift or squat or overhead press correctly early on and i wasn't doing those movements with them now the important part was i get them I assess if they can do it. They can't do it. It doesn't mean I go, oh, check that off. We're never doing that again. Right. Here's some extra exercise we can do. Instead of that, 
it is, okay, temporarily, we're going to do these movements. We're going to work our way back to those very impactful exercises that have a lot of value. We, it, that's just it. Like, and you get this from a lot of physicians, too. Like, if you talked about any kind of pain or limitation that you have, we'll avoid doing those exercises. And then yep. it's that's the end of the conversation. Yeah, you, you, you have to understand that there's certain um, types of human movement that I guess we could label as foundational, right? Um, like in other words, your body's supposed to move these ways. And in, in rare circumstances, they can't because of maybe some genetic uh, reasons, or maybe you had an injury that did fundamentally change your anatomy. But for the most part, you should be able to do certain types of movements. Like for example, you should be able to walk. So imagine if you went to the doctor and like, oh my God, walking kind of hurts my knee. And the doctor says, well, yeah. stop walking. Yeah, don't do it anymore. Yeah. We're not gonna have you walk anymore. I'm sponsored right? sponsored so, by a rascal scooter. Yeah, exactly. So um, and now here's the here's the challenge, right? Okay, I can't do those. Well, can I do something instead that A, will get me to, to be able to do that at some point, but B, won't have me losing my gains or at least, you know, have me still moving in the right direction? That's the question, right? Right. So let me get this clear. So the idea of this episode is let's pick, you know, these, you know, four or five or six whatever movements that are common where people have pain give them a alternative of what we would replace that with temporarily mm -hmm. and then also mobility corrective stuff to address it to work yeah. towards getting there yep, yep. okay yeah absolutely okay um and and talk about some of the most common reasons why people can't do some of these movements so of course uh there's always a wide individual variance but generally speaking when i would train you know i've, I've trained personally hundreds of clients and thousands if you if you count by proxy right with the trainers that work for me and the gyms that I've managed and all that stuff. And you see very common trends. Like mm -hmm. I would say, you know, there's like 80% of the reason why most people can't squat or deadlift or, or these few things, right? There's always the the exceptions to the rule. And we can't speak to individuals because yeah. we're doing a, 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 you know, a podcast or a show. But we're going to be able to hit most people, I think, uh, who are kind of in this category. And what you don't want to do is this. I remember this as a kid. I remember this is before I really became a good trainer. I remember I would uh, go to the gym and, and I was lucky that I got influenced by some really good strength athletes as a, as a young lifter. And it, it made a huge impact on my physique and eventually how I started training people. But I, I, I was a kid in the gym, 16, 17, doing you know deadlifts and squats and overhead presses and stuff like that. And every once in a while, I would get the older guy come up to me and say, oh, I used to I used to squat. I can't do that anymore because my knees are bad. You should probably stop doing that. Or I used to deadlift and, mm -hmm. you know, my back, it just, I can't do it anymore. You should probably stop doing that. And I remember thinking, well, that's weird. It's exercise. Like it's something that's supposed to make you stronger and feel better. Yeah. You must have been doing it in a way that wasn't either right or that wasn't right for your body or using a weight that you couldn't handle or whatever. I remember even thinking that as a kid because I thought that's very strange. Why? Why couldn't I be able to do this as I got older? It's, I'm making myself healthier. It made no sense to me. It didn't make any sense to me at all. Well, not only that, but let's say you are somebody who, who can't do some of these movements because of injury or whatever the reason being, there's tremendous value in the pursuit. Like, let's pretend I get a client. This has happened too. I get somebody who um, we never ended up deadlifting. Yep. Or we never ended up squatting. Yep. But that was the goal, was to get to that place and the pursuit of that goal and the things that I was doing as a trainer with that client to help them mm -hmm. get to be able to do a squat or a deadlift has so much value. Yeah, because you got far. Right. And, yep. and and we improved so many things along the way, even though we may not ever got to a place where I loaded the bar barbell and did a back, uh, back barbell squat or whatever. I didn't get there. But the stuff that we accomplished on the way there was so valuable to that person. So... I think that's the the lesson when you're having a yeah. conversation around like squatting, deadlifting, and you've been told by a doctor that, oh, you shouldn't do it, or you've heard, oh, it's so risky, so mm -hmm. you avoid it, or you've tried it, and you noticed your knees hurt, or your low back hurt, or your neck hurt, or your shoulders hurt, and so you avoid it, and saying, don't completely avoid it. Maybe we temporarily avoid doing that specific movement, but the end goal should be, okay, this is a, a very fundamental movement that either hurts me or I can't do. So instead of just saying, I'm never going to do it again, how about I work towards building a program mm -hmm. and doing movements and exercises yeah. that may get me back to that place to being able to do that again? Look at it as a weakness that you're going to build up strength towards and be 
uh, you know, solid in that going forward. So it's something that you have to really work on identifying the root. Like, wh where's the weakness lie? Where's the instability lie? And so it just takes a little more effort to go through the process of rebuilding that back up so everything communicates well and mm -hmm. everything supports as it should because we're looking at it as dysfunction. We're looking at it as something that uh, is part of the movement that is not firing correctly. Something isn't doing its job properly. So we go back, we, we, we kind of dissect it and we look and we find out, okay, for me, so if we talk about our first one that we have here is the deadlift. So this was a big one for me because it's, it's one that I've battled in terms of like having back issues with, uh, and I did injure myself a bit, uh, by shifting the weight just, just ever so gradually, but with a lot of weight on it and, and it, and it, uh, affected my QL. And so this is something I had to keep building my way back towards, you know, being able to put substantial weight on there. Mm -hmm. Um, but that process has you know, helped to identify, you know, certain things in dysfunction that I need to address with my hips, uh, you know, having asymmetry and having a bit of an imbalance. And so this is something I need to constantly think about and work on strengthening. Totally. And, you know, before we even get deep into deadlifts, there's one more point I want to make that's really important. And I literally had this thought, and I knew this, but I had this thought again <coughs> over the weekend. I went hiking with my wife and there's this trail that we go on and um, there's this, this part where there's like this pond. And so I picked up some rocks and I was skipping them and I was whipping these, these rocks to skip it across this pond. And my shoulder was getting a little sore. And I remember as a kid, man, I, you know, I was 13, 14, 15, I could throw really hard. I just was able to throw very, very I remember my uncle who was a, a collegiate, uh, baseball player. I remember him saying, man, you got a, a good arm on you. I cannot throw at all. Like I used to. Why? Cause I stopped doing it. Right. I, the old term. Mm -hmm use it or lose it is very, very, very true. Like if right now you stop walking completely yeah. and you go do leg strengthening exercises, but you don't walk, you never walk, wait five, 10 years, go try to walk. You've lost a lot of that skill of something that, you know, you were born um, to do. Listen, so when you don't do the exercise, you lose it. Everybody's got a picture of themselves playing with toys when they were a two-year-old in the squatted position yeah, uh -huh. like ever, ever at one point in your life you were doing that so and at one point in your life you lost it it just happened gradually over time yeah. that a lot of people don't even realize it's sneaking up on them you know they, you just stop doing it you you stop doing it then you lose it like you said yeah so you don't want to avoid these movements completely like we like we're saying you want to go back to be able to do it because the longer you go without doing them the harder it is to get yourself to be able to do them again and you don't want to lose some of these skills. Now you brought the deadlift. It is a fun, it is a foundational movement. Lifting something up off the floor is probably one of the most yeah. uh, fundamental. You know, you're going to encounter movement. that a lot. Yeah, in like real when, life. Like yeah, even now, even in our super sedentary lives, you still have to go down and pick something up like a deadlift. I pick up my kids and I play with them. I move boxes. I have to move the couch. Uh, you know, you pick up your dog or a, a bag of dog food. The deadlift, that type of mo motion is very, very fundamental. So it's important that you be able to deadlift and you strengthen that movement. And it's a common one that people say they can't do. And usually it has to do with the fact that they're back, right? It hurts my back in a well, way that's not most right. Common. Well, I think there's, okay, there's a little bit more here too, right? And I, rem I clearly remember this when I went from somebody who, because I didn't train the deadlift or the squat that, that often when I first started training. It was, I avoided it um, like many people do. And one of the biggest takeaways that I noticed I did was I, when I started to train. When I started to train squats and deadlifts on a, more religiously, I would notice when I do something, and it could be something as simple as like picking a kid up or lifting the couch up. Because I started to train that hinge pattern for, for so long inside the gym, mm -hmm. I had that pattern when I went to pick the couch up or I went to pick the kid up. It just happened I didn't more round the but yeah, it happened automatically because I trained it mm -hmm. yep. in the gym that when I hinge over, I load the hips to, yep. to grasp me, even if it's something light. And what you see is in normal behaviors or patterns for people that don't train that movement, you just round at the back. 
if you just drop something on the floor and you tell someone to pick it up, very few people, few people hinge at the hip to go grab it. They just round the back and yeah. they go over. And when it's really light, they don't think anything of it like it's no big deal. But all it takes is that weight or just being slightly out of line when you do it and then you hurt yourself. And training those movements in the gym, that's why it translates. Because I know people hear you saying that sometimes. They're like, well... I still, I bend over, I pick up couch stuff or I lean over, I do, but pay attention to how you do it. When you grab something, everybody's watching or listening right now. Think of the next time you pick up a mm -hmm. you know, bag of dog food or groceries or anything with any weight at all off the ground. Stop yourself in the middle of it. Next time, or if you're listening right now and you're cleaning the house or do something, like pay attention to how you bend over. Yeah. Do you bend over properly? Do you load the hips? to pick something up or do you just round at the back yeah. and, and do that? And that's what's setting you up. And this is why these movements are so important is if you train it in the gym and it becomes a, a common practice, then it becomes it's hardwired. Yeah. It's hardwired and it's, you don't even have to think about it anymore. It's just what you naturally do when you go to grab something out in the real world. You know what you reminded me of as a kid, I remember uh, my dad and his cousins got this dirt bike and my dad was kind of showing off or whatever and fell. It was going like 30 miles an hour, flies off. I remember as a kid getting freaked out and my dad rolled like four or five times and then stood up. He was totally fine. Hmm. What he, he did a judo roll. My dad was a competitive judo player uh, in yeah. Italy and he got up and everybody's like, oh my God, and he had some scratches, but that was about it. And he goes, man, it's in my, he's like, it's ingrained. He goes, when I, I went over, I just went right into my, right. He, my tucked, he probably tucked his head and then just let himself he, 100%. roll versus freaking out and fighting. Yeah. Pla placing his hands worse. out in front could have broke yeah. his wrist or whatever. So, all right. So let's go back to the deadlift. And most commonly people will have pain in their low back. Here's a great exercise to do instead of the deadlift. It's very similar. And that's a single leg deadlift. Most people whose back bothers them when they do, unless you have a bad injury, but I'm talking about chronic pain, like, oh, it kind of bothers When I do deadlifts, if it's really sore, it doesn't feel good. Single leg deadlifts, usually you could do, first off, the load is way lighter. Yeah. You got to slow down. Balance is involved. So you're automatically trying to stabilize. And it's a very similar movement. And if you get stronger in the single leg deadlift, there's a very strong chance it'll carry over to your traditional deadlift. And the biggest dis disconnect uh, a lot of times is this like very subtle shift. Mm -hmm. um, and this is something that with a single leg deadlift, you can really hone in on that anti-rotation in the hips. Yeah. Okay. And so if you really slow down and put a lot of intent in that exercise, this is one of those things that this is this is the root of a lot of the problems that are leading into uh, low back uh, inflammation and not feeling like you can handle like that kind of Yeah. Load. By the way, a lot of these exercises that you're going to see that we replace the exercise with until you can get back to it, right? They're similar enough to the exercise you're replacing it with that you don't lose a ton of the gains and oh, strength no. and stuff. Oh, and arguably, I mean, I would make the case that this one is, I mean, this to me is a, regardless if you can or can't deadlift, this is a, a movement that I, I just- I did this. I, I just, went in single leg deadlift. I, yeah, I just think yep. this. I just think this belongs in everybody's routine. It's uh, you know, I brought up the other day on the show um uh, a movement that uh, it was actually when we were making fun of like the the multiple movements in one, and I actually was calling myself out that there's a movement that I've told uh my client that hey, it, it, we move on, you don't ever see me again, and you know, don't lose this ability to step up, to hinge over, and to, yeah. to touch your toe. And part of that movement is is that's a single leg deadlift. I mean, a hinging, a single leg toe touch is essentially a a single leg deadlift. And part of why that is is that that st that hip stability and strength that you get from balancing on one leg and then hinging at the hips is is so important to keeping your your low back strong and supported yep. as you age. That I think this movement belongs in every routine regardless if you can can or cannot deadlift but if you can't this is an obvious go-to single leg deadlift mm -hmm. and get there and I, I like to do it with dumbbells in fact or your body weight so if you've never done it before um, try just doing it just your body weight at first and get good at the at the movement and stabilizing without falling over a lot of people will do one or two reps and have to tip over yeah, so count. yeah get good at balancing through say 10 reps of single leg toe touches and then once you got the stability there then load it maybe with some light dumbbells and th that's a movement I think yep. should be in everybody's repertoire now uh, there could be a lot of reasons why your lower back bothers you when you deadlift but the most common reasons have to do with some kind of a hip and core, Weakness or imbalance. Mm -hmm. So I would focus on hip mobility. Um, I like different versions of 9090s for that. It's one of my favorite kind of general hip mobility type of drill. 
Um, and there's different versions of this, uh, but I find them to be very, very effective. And then work on strengthening your core. In particular, um, lo cable chops are really good and bracing exercises like planks, but proper planks. They can really help you with your deadlift because uh, oblique imbalances, you tend to see mm -hmm. issues uh, that, that contribute to like QL type problems, right? right? Yep. Um, and then core stability. Can you brace and stabilize your core? And so planks done properly, right, where you kind of tuck the tailbone and really brace the core, that can really help solve some of these issues. Because like I said, nine out of 10 times, it's either a core or a hip issue that's causing that low back pain uh, with the deadlift. That's one of the reasons why I really like uh, the assisted McGill planes is because you get a little bit of both of that, mm -hmm. right? So you get the, the the stability component in there, you get some core in there, and you get some strength as you rotate over. So that's a good one to add there. By the way, it's a good opportunity to tell our audience, especially if you're new to the podcast, that anytime we talk about movements, um, one of the first things that you should do if you're trying to figure out what we're talking about is literally just to go to YouTube and put in mind pump and then the movement that we're saying. And even if it's general, like we're saying hip mobility, if you literally went mind pump, hip mobility, you'd see like all these videos that we've done yep. re related to that. You'd see the 90-90, you'd probably see the Miguel plan, you'd see some of these movements. Right. So um, a lot of people don't realize how, how big the library is that we've made for mm -hmm. uh, all the exercises that we talk about. So if you're hearing this and you don't know or you've heard us talk about a movement and you're not sure what that is, try searching on there first and you should find it. Perfect. No problem. Now the next exercise is the good old squat. Uh, many people refer to it as the king of all exercises. I would agree. It's probably, uh, it's definitely up there. Tremendous muscle strength gains, metabolism boosting gains in studies that show positive hormone responses, squats, crush every exercise. Great for performance, general power. It's just a phenomenal exercise. But let's say you squat, your knee hurts. That's a common area. People, oh, my knees bother me or maybe my lower back bother me. Here are some movements you can do to replace the squat. And again, what you'll notice is these movements are similar enough to the squat to where there's a lot of carryover. Mm -hmm. Any split stance type squat, like a stationary lunge, or even a uh, a goblet squat, or a Bulgarian, Bulgarian. split stance squat. Mm -hmm. Phenomenal. What you'll notice, by the way, when you do a split stance, here, okay, so we call them lunges. Most That's the most popular name, right? Lunges. It's actually a squat, and it's called a split stance squat. If you look at the front leg of a yeah. lunge, it's, it's doing, doing all, most of the work. It's doing exactly what you would do in a yeah. squat. So now you're still doing a squatting movement with that front leg, but most people who have issues with squats can still do those split stance exercises. I think it's a very viable alternative in while you're in the process of getting back to being Well, I like that you put a goblet squat in there too because many times the limiting factor is um, the ankle mobility yep. and, and be able to stay upright and the goblet squat forces somebody in that. Plus, uh, you, you start to train somebody to get used to that pattern and depth that they may not do before or they may not be able to do. Mm -hmm. So I like the combination of if this person does has a hard time squatting, uh, and even uh, heels elevated, like you didn't put that on there, but I think that uh, a goblet squat with the heels elevated. If the ankle's the limiting factor. Right, right? which it's going to be for a lot of people. There's yeah, very that's few one people, of the more common ones. Right, it's almost it's almost guaranteed that most people that have a hard time squatting have limited ankle mobility. It's rare yeah. that I find somebody doesn't have some sort of uh, limiting factor with their ankles. So doing the heels elevated goblet squat uh, in conjunction with Bulgarian split squats would be my remedy. Well, and I like that we didn't say specifically single leg squat because there's so much balance and uh, stability that you have to fight through with that, which is fine. That that could be a focus on its own, but um, to have a split stance, you get that same effect, but you have a little more stable position. Mm -hmm. But you're now you're isolating one side to the left or one side to the right. Now you can actually see a visible difference between the two where you might need to bring one up in terms of strength. Uh, there may be some weaknesses there to address. What a great point and conversation to be had. Okay, we just said deadlift. Yeah. We all agreed that the single leg deadlift mm -hmm. would be great here. But then we go into squat and we, no one says single yeah, leg if squat. If your ankle mobility doesn't let you do a, a bilateral squat, it ain't going to let you do a single leg squat. You're just going to shake right. a lot. <laughs> Not to mention a pistol squat single leg squat is very very difficult like a single leg toe touch is real i could take an 80 year old client yeah. and and they can do a a single leg toe touch or i could get them to that relatively right. easy 
but a pistol squat, a single leg squat, the no. strength required. And look at the ankle mobility. You know, look the how ankle much mobility is for sure. Yeah. That's number one. Number two is, let's say you had good ankle mobility, trying to get somebody out of the bottom position of yeah. a pistol squat. And then what ends up happening is they cheat their way out, and then we end up just creating bad patterns. So uh, I'm glad you brought that up, Justin, because the maybe the obvious to a young trainer would be like, Oh, well, okay, single leg deadlift. So then single leg squat is kind of the obvious. Right. Well, no, you if, if do your that. back bothers you with deadlifts, a single leg deadlift probably is okay. If your knees bother you with a squat, they're going to really bother you with a single leg squat. That's right. Yeah. So that's why we're not. Because it needs to travel substantially yes. further forward that's right. with a single leg Further squat. forward, you need more ankle mobility with yeah. a single leg squat than you do a traditional squat. Uh, this more, that's a lot of load for that particular exercise. Split stance allows you to do that, re requires less ankle mobility. You need less ankle mobility for a split stance squat. You, it's it's easier on the knee. It's easier on the back, um, and it still mirrors the movement enough right. to where you're gonna get similar gains. And I want to add one to this, uh, and this is really just um, if if you need, really need to regress, like you, you, like squats are are very painful for you, mm -hmm. and you know, and you want to still get some good activity in the legs and and so i would throw in like a, a sled pushes and sled oh, pulls in there yeah. as well just to to be able to get you know your client some um Great idea. muscle contraction in, in volume and really start to slowly build that yeah ink uh, um sled drives are one of the safest uh, super effective exercises that I can think about. So that's a great that's a great point. And as far as mobility stuff, it's ankles and hips. Yep. Right? Yep. I yeah. Mean, an ankles. And, and which, offenders. by the way, uh, if you uh, if it resonated with you when Sal said your knees hurt when you squat, which is probably one of the most common things you hear mm -hmm. from squat, it's not the knees. It's normally ankles and hips. Eight, eight out of ten times. It's yeah. The, I'd it's say nine ankle. and a half out yeah. of ten times. Like it's it's rarely, and that's even coming from somebody who had knee surgery or has quote unquote mm -hmm. bad knees. It's the the issue is actually happening from the the lack of ankle mobility or the lack of of hip and strength in your in your hip that is causing the stress. Yeah, think about it knee. this way, right? The 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 knee just fle it just flexes and extends, right? So it just flexes and extends. But boy, the ankle can move in all kinds of different directions, and so can the hip. That's mm -hmm. right. So when there's an instability issue there, the knee, which can't bend laterally, it mm. can't rotate, which the, the hip and the ankle could both do. It's going where you're directing it. Yeah, the knee is, is like straining to try to stay together while the hip and the ankle are not doing their job. So even if you have knee issues, right? So I'll have people DM me and say, yeah, but my MRI showed that I have you know, patellar chondromalacia, or I had to have this... And it's like, that was still often caused by the ankle and hip. That's fix right. that. And I've had people yep. who've come in with knee issues. We fix the ankle, many people fix the ankle and hip issues. The knee pain is, is completely That's why wrong. I wanted to say that. And that's why yep. I said nine and a half out of 10, because there is someone listening right now who has been told they have bad knees or their knees hurt. And they think that it's the <clears> knee <throat> that is limiting them from squatting. And it's not. I don't care what you've done to it. 99% of the time, if you address your ankle and your hip mobility and strength and you get good mobility, yep. good strength and control in those two joints, this one ends up yep. it ends up not. Because the muscle should be taking care. When you squat, the knees shouldn't be taking any of the stress. Yeah, there's, ten, ligaments should not be bearing the load. Like you have ligaments that prevent your knee from bending laterally. You should not be placing so much stress on your knee laterally that it's the ligaments that are preventing it from, from bending laterally, right? It's the muscle that does that, the muscle around it, and it's stable. If it goes to the ligaments, eventually those ligaments are going to hurt and maybe even tear. Right. So that's the reason. Ankle mobility, uh, combat stretch, one of my favorites. Very basic, very simple. Great for improving ankle mobility. We have videos on our YouTube channel for that. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about hip mobility. I still like the 9090 for that. By the way, uh, what's the website for the free webinar on mobility that we did? The, uh, the is Prime it, Pro? Is it, so is it, yeah, Prime, Prime Pro, Pro webinar web and Maps Prime webinar. Okay, so primeprowebinar.com and then mapsprimewebinar.com. Both free webinars, both lots of mobility movements. Uh, all of which you're going to hear in this episode. You yeah, can go you say on there. All of them are related to this. Yeah, you can go on there and just follow the. And literally, it's Justin and Adam teaching them. So you'll actually have some of the best coaches in the business teaching you how to how to do these because mobility movements are quite specific in how they should be applied. So if you just look at pictures, you will not. I promise you won't do them right. There's an intent that's uh, definitely involved. <laughs> all right, overhead press. Another common exercise that people say they can't do. 
Oftentimes, the issue with the overhead press has to do with the shoulder. Mm -hmm. it, it hurts my shoulder. If I push anything overhead, I feel like there's this impinging pain or I feel pain in the back. Most common areas are in the front of the shoulder, down the side, or in the back. And, of course, people avoid this incredibly amazing exercise. And, by the way, you should be able to push things up above your head. So this is, again, yeah. another fundamental movement. I love overhead carries for this. I love giving clients... Something to hold at arm's length, by the way, if they're not that strong, it could be the lightest thing ever, but mm -hmm. just have them or nothing. I've actually done this with clients too. I'll have them just straighten their arm out as well as they can stabilize and then try to walk while keeping the arm totally straight next to their head. That stabilization uh, really helped later on. It was a great way to, I guess, well, supplement. This actually addresses a lot of, um, well, with a lot of my clients, having something overhead was the... Uh, the most unstable feeling that they had of any exercise uh, and would want to bring the weight down almost immediately. Yes. Uh, and so now we're, we're keeping it up overhead and teaching your body how to brace properly so that way it doesn't uh, create a problem for your lower back, a problem for your shoulders, um, and to be able to then uh, figure out too how to – to pack that shoulder, how to like build even more stability around the support system with weight over your head. It's just so valuable because now, you know, when your body gets to that point where you get full extension, you're very comfortable, familiar with that position. Totally. This has to be the most common, I would say. Mm. Right. Uh, I mean, I think that, and I think that's just because of all the things we're talking about, even like squatting and deadlifting, like people naturally hinge over, squat down, get up, you get in and out of your car, you get in and out of the table, the toilet. Mm -hmm. There's so many things that you, you, you're forced to somewhat squat. There's not a lot of things in life that forces you to fully extend. Yeah. Fully extend up over your head. I mean, it's not very common. The closest is what putting away dishes yeah. that, that mm -hmm. come to mind for oh. me, like the average person. Oh, or, I guarantee if yeah. you took 20, people over the age of 45, mm -hmm. at least, and this is over 45, you, as it gets older, the, the percentage will be out. I bet you 50% of them cannot get full extension yeah. above their head where their bicep yeah, and extra the ear. Like, and this is the most difficult. construction jobs, maybe. You know? <laughs> yeah, right. But that's about it. Uh, this is probably the most difficult for me still today. And that's, and I think it's just because of that. It's just, we don't do a lot of things mm -hmm. um, where we're fully extended like that. I, I would add to this, the Z press. Um, well, the mm -hmm. Z press is definitely focusing on that full extension. Yeah, I just it that, that movement. I I know like people are probably tired of hearing me talk about it on the show, but I can't help myself when I find something that uh, blows my mind on like. Uh, and that was a movement yeah. that got introduced to me way later. Like it, you, I didn't. You just started doing that so like valuable. five years ago. Yeah, it wasn't that long ago that I got introduced to that, and it's now become this movement that I teach. And I, I it's so impactful that. I actually would probably never teach an overhead press first. I would always teach a Z press first mm -hmm. to help them mm -hmm. get that stability, that full extension down, and the ability to tighten their core up in oh, that full yeah. extension, stabilize. Like I would teach that all first before I even move to an. If overhead. I had to do this over again and start training like that, hundred percent, right, would be the first uh, thing that I would address. And because of the fact that uh, you know a lot of. Um, a lot of the imbalances and a lot of the compensations lie when you're like getting your full body involved. And now your your legs want to like add a little English to it. You want to use Arch a large back. low back. Yeah, and so it just sort of um, you know this 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 bad pattern goes all the way up the kinetic chain. Whereas now you kind of eliminate that as being a source of uh, stability, and you really have to focus mm -hmm. in on your core's ability to brace properly, which is everything. Yeah. yeah. Now another carry. So I talked about the overhead carry is a rack. Carry. Carry. And the rack carry is when you're holding the weight here at the shoulder. So you can either do this with dumbbells and it's like this kind of supinated position here, like an oral press, or with a kettlebell where it's sitting here, but you have to support it with the strength of your shoulder. And you hold it and you stand stable and you walk. And what it does is it's an isometric movement for the bottom of an overhead press. And the reason why I put that there is the other reason lots of people can't do an overhead press properly isn't the top, but at the bottom, rather. They, they, it hurts when they get too low. And so you see people do mm -hmm. these kind of short type of presses. And that full range of motion is really important. Well, and a lot of times, um, too, they were taught to only go like that 90 yep. degree and then extension from there. And so this is very unfamiliar uh, to keep weight in close to the body like that and be able to create that spiral line press, which you know, actually follows a more functional uh, line for the shoulder to, to go with. And so that 
to the other point of that is to to maintain healthy rotator cuffs yeah. and health you know the the supporting cast so uh, you know to incorporate rotation uh with your shoulder because it's a vital function of the shoulder is mm -hmm. imperative well to that point that's why the mobility movements that i would do to complement this would be something like handcuff with rotation hands yep. down yep. i mean handcuff with rotation it takes you through the the, the fullest range of motion it's of the everything. shoulder yeah and it addresses the rotator cuff like you're saying and i i think it's the ultimate you know, one-stop shop, like priming movement for the shoulders. Mm -hmm. um, so I, that would be one. And then maybe our, our zone one test, like the wall press, I mm -hmm. think is mm -hmm. phenomenal. Uh, those two would probably be what I would do in conjunction with the the uh, Z press and then the overhead yeah. carries and rack carries you're talking about. And then you could do a very, and although this is incomplete, I think this still has some value, just some external rotation, which is very simple. You can literally hold a band between your arms and and rotate out with your elbows at your side or do one arm with the band where the arm is kind of rotating out with your elbow at your side to strengthen some of those uh, rotator cuff muscles that you're talking about, those external rotators, because that one tends to be weak in people. Yeah. By the way, I think we should address, because uh, I know the next thing that we get to episodes like this is the follow-up of, well, how much, how much, and what time, and people want this prescription of a, when you're doing mobility stuff to address an imbalance or work on a, a stronger connection like you can't do too much yeah, just practice it just practice, practice it like crazy these are not these aren't lifts where you're going into it with the idea of like trying to max They're out or damaging yeah this isn't a you know do 20 reps with like 30 second rest between and then do it again it's, no. it's not like that it's practice these yeah. practice these movements get good at it practice as much as you can don't think about doing it in intensely think about trying to do it perfectly with mm -hmm. intent yeah the yeah. idea is to be perfect in the movement yeah here's a good rule of thumb you know, uh, in the morning at night you know spend 10 minutes on on doing yeah. some of this stuff the ones that really ritualize it that you need the most help with and you'll see really rapid pro i mean really rapid progress if you do it that way all right so the next one is the bench press, right? Everybody's favorite exercise to do on Mondays in the big yeah. gyms. And typically when people can't bench press, it's usually the shoulder that bothers yeah. them. And quite often, it's the front of the shoulder that they'll feel. Now, I want you to, this is quite common, pain in the front of the shoulder oftentimes has to do with the bicep tendon that runs along the front of the shoulder. Now, it's not that you're necessarily, your bicep is at fault here, but rather... The positioning your shoulder, lack of stability, is causing undue stress on that bicep tendon that runs over. So when you're pressing with heavy weight, you start to have um, some issues. And often this comes from an imbalance between the muscles that push and the muscles that pull. Mm -hmm. So you've got you bench all the time, but your rows aren't so great, and you don't have what's called called good scapular retraction where your shoulders come back. Mm -hmm. So we'll get to some of the correctional exercise. Here's a good thing you can replace the bench press with. Just a, a good old incline dumbbell press. I for want, most people, it's not an issue. For the exact reasons that you said, too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've loved... This was also something that happened for me later on in my career. Like uh, Always, I struggled with teaching a client. Like, if you've never done bench press before, as, as basic of a movement as that may seem, uh, many people struggle with it. Uh, more so now than ever, too, because we're so forward. It's way more technical yeah. than it looks. It is. It? And, and and when the average eye, that's, and even the, the young trainer, like when I would look at someone doing a bench press, it, it would look like it doesn't look bad. Yeah, you're but just pushing it up. Yeah, yeah, it's it's hard to see it unless you know exactly what you're looking for. And very few people retract and depress their shoulders before they bench press. I mean, that don't know what they're doing. You see great, obviously, all people that bench press well yeah. or like competitors, you'll see that. You'll see the way they get into a bench press. They get themselves all wedged in. They have that kind of nice little arch in their low back and their shoulders are really retract and depressed before they go into pressing. What I love about the incline dumbbell press is it naturally puts you in that position. So even if a client doesn't have a doesn't do very well with being able to activate those muscles and get themselves in that position naturally. Gravity's on your side. That's right. Gravity is going to kind of do that. Because you're at this you're at a 45 degree bench and you're holding these dumbbells, it it kind of naturally mm -hmm. sinks the shoulder shoulder blades down, down and back like mm -hmm. you want. And so I just find it as an easier move. I get, like we talked about the Z press, going back, knowing what I know now, if I were to start all over as a trainer, I probably would very, very, very few times would I start a client ever on a barbell bench press. I would almost always now start on an incline dumbbell press to get technique down yeah, first before I progress to the barbell. That was the second half of my career. The first half was like benching, benching. And the second half was like, no, 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 we're going to get really good. At the incline, incline dumbbells, and then we'll graduate. Build uh, good to the patterns, bench. and then we can build off of that. Yeah. Now, here's a hack, by the way. If the front of your shoulder hurts you, and it is indeed the bicep tendon, try this out before you do your incline dumbbell presses. Do a static bicep stretch 
for about 30 seconds on each arm and then go do your pressing. Now, it's not a fix, but what it does do is it alleviates some of the pain and allow you to press with Well, a perfect form. scenario would be stretch and then do row. Rose. Well, yeah, that's the best. That's the right. second. So, yeah. yeah, perfect thing would be to rubber stretch. Band rows. That's right. Stretch the bicep tendon, then go right into some rubber band rows or just do some light barbell yeah. rows just to just work pump primes the upper. you to get your, your shoulder blades set in a good position. Yeah. Yes, work on that upper mid back area. By the way, just because you row doesn't mean you're working on the upper back uh, area. If you're rowing with your shoulders forward, it's a lat row. You might as well do a pull up. You want to pull the shoulders back and down while you're doing the row. Strengthen those mid back muscles. That's what's going to keep your shoulder healthy for when you do bench presses and you go back to doing bench presses, I should say. All right, the next exercise. I know, Adam, you wanted to add this. I think you're absolutely right. And that's dips. Uh, most people, I don't say most, I'd say a majority of people um, have a small majority have trouble with dips. It hurts their shoulders. Yeah, I think it's just, I think they're, uh, it c goes back to what we were talking about with, you know, range of motion and shoulders and the ability to pull the shoulder blades back. I think that we're in this fixed forward type position all the time. And then you ask somebody to go into a dip position and it's like the, uh, you're yeah. pulling yeah. and stretching on that. And I think that just, it's painful for a lot of people. And so, they avoid it. You also see some people that's they they don't have that range of motion, and then they go and do something where they load the dips or oh, things yeah. like that, and then you they tear or hurt themselves. So uh, this was a common one. It was common that I would get somebody who wanted to do dips, but then every time they did dips, it, they would feel this this stress in their shoulders when they try and yeah, go down. Yeah, that's past the 90. most common I've saw was just like the protracted shoulder where you know we're trying to now also like dip down, and we really should be more expansive with our chest and in, in, in dips and, and to get the full advantage of it. Uh, but yeah, that was always a big common one because then it would go right direct it into uh, you know the shoulder and it'd be create pain immediately totally um close grip uh, bench press or close grip incline press even better and when i say close grip by the way i know some people are like put your hands all the way together no your your wrists don't really bend that well that way <laughs> it's like shoulder width yeah you know do about a shoulder width bench press keeping your elbows relatively tucked and uh and that is a great substitute for dips we'll still train your triceps still train your shoulders it's close enough to dips where you won't lose a lot of your performance from dips, but it does train a lot of the similar muscles. And the issues with the dips is almost always having to do with the shoulders. It's shoulder mobility, lack of rotation, lack of stability, handcuffs with rotation. It's like a, a really good general overall shoulder mobility exercise that will also help with dips. Yeah, I w you know to figure out where to – like everybody wants to know where to grab the bar, and that's the wrong question because we're all – there's wider, more narrow. Yeah. And like, so the way I would tell a client is I'd, I'd have them pinch their elbows next to their rib cage and then get their forearms straight. Like you, you're, so your there's forearm, your grip. Yeah. There's your grip. Yeah. So that's where you grab the bar. It's not look at the bar and go, Oh, where do I grab it for close grip? And should I grab here? Should I grab here? Should I grab here? It's like, no, take your elbows, pinch them right by your side. And I'm looking for that nice 90 degree bend. Mm -hmm. And it looks, it's all perpendicular to my body. That's where I want to grab the bar. I think that's the, the, the best place. And yeah. then that's all you're thinking about as you come down the close grip is you're, you're keeping the elbows tucked in close because we're focusing on tricep and it's not a close grip bench press for your chest. We're keeping the elbows in tight by your side and focusing on the yeah. tricep. Uh, wall circles are great too. I really like that. Never done those before. I, mm -hmm. I learned them from Justin. It's in our, we now have it in some of our programs. And the, the wall gives you feedback, allows you to move through this kind of full range of motion. You're externally rotating, internally rotating. You're extending and depressing. And mm -hmm. it's a really good full range of motion kind of intrinsic tension exercise, meaning there's no external tension. Mm -hmm. So it's very safe. There's nothing pushing against you that's going to cause you to injure yourself. And you can see measurable results when you practice it regularly. Like you'll see literally if you practice mm -hmm. this for five or ten minutes today – Tomorrow, if you practice again, you'll notice a little bit of an improvement. That's how it's fast you're very enlightening the full potential you can achieve uh, in terms of like how how much range of motion your shoulder is capable of. It's really kind of crazy. Uh, and you don't realize that until you actually put yourself in that position where you test it. And again, this is another one of those exercises you really want to take your time with and be gradual. If you don't have that range of motion yet, you back off a bit. You the next time you do it, guaranteed you're going to go a little further. Yeah. So the the all these movements that we just went over, if any of them ring a bell for you that you avoid because of aches and pains or someone told you you shouldn't do it, use the movements, uh, especially the mobility stuff, and practice. 
and pra- just practice as and, much and, as you and can. And for the time being, replace them with the exercise yes. that we provide you. That's that's the idea. Replace them with, if there's a program that has them, you can't do them. The movements we gave, that's what you replace with. And then the rest of the week, you're trying to incorporate it as much as you can. Just and go light and practice and work on technique and get good at it. Yes. And again, those, those sites, they're free webinars. So they're free classes taught by Adam and Justin. There's no catch, nothing like you just go on there and and watch them. It's it's uh, primeprowebinar.com. And then the other one is mapsprimewebinar.com. The difference is the mapsprimewebinar.com is taught by Justin. He takes you through a few compass tests, what are called compass tests, that help you identify your own imbalances. And then the one Adam takes you through is a little more in depth. There's no tests, but he takes you through all the major joints of the body and shows you some phenomenal mobility movements. And he coaches you through doing them. So you really figure out um, how to do them well. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any fitness goal. And again, they're free, mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So Justin is at mindpumpjustin. I'm at mindpumpsal and Adam is at mindpumpadam. <laughs>